Welcome to the first lecture of the deep learning course. In this lecture, we will discuss the basics of neural networks, what they are and how to use them. We will begin with a basic outline of what neural networks are. Then we will show how to apply them to basic machine learning tasks like classification and regression. And finally, we will show you something a little bit different, how you can use neural networks to build specialized architectures. And we will do this by showing you one example of these kinds of architectures, namely the autoencoder. As I said, we will start with a quick recap of the basic principles behind neural networks. We expect you've seen most of this before, but it's worth revisiting the most important parts and setting up our names and our notation for them. The name neural network comes from neurons, the cells that make up most of our brain and nervous system. A neuron receives multiple different input signals from other cells, through connections called dendrites. It processes these in a relatively simple way, deriving a single new output signal, which it sends out through its single axon. The axon then branches out so that this one signal can reach multiple other cells. In the very early days of AI, the late 1950s, researchers decided to try a simple approach. The brain is the only intelligent system we know, and the brain is made of neurons. So why don't we simply model neurons in a computer. The idea of a neuron needed to be radically simplified to work with computers of that age, but doing so yielded one of the first successful machine learning systems, the perceptron. The perceptron has a number of inputs, each of which is multiplied by a weight. The result is summed over all weights and inputs together with a bias parameter to provide the output y of the perceptron. If we're doing binary classification, we can, for instance, take the sign of the output as the class. If the output is bigger than zero, we predict class A, and if it's lower than zero, we predict class B. The bias parameter is often represented by a special input node whose value is fixed to one, so that the bias itself simply becomes another weight, which is multiplied by this particular input. For most of you, this will be nothing new. This is simply a linear classifier or a linear regression model. It just happens to be drawn as a network. But the real power of the brain doesn't come from single neurons. It comes from chaining together a large number of neurons. So can we do the same thing with perceptrons? Link the output of one perceptron to one of the inputs of the next in a large network, and so make the whole more powerful than any single perceptron could be. This is where the perceptron turns out to be too simple an abstraction. Composing perceptrons, making the output of one the input of another, doesn't make them more powerful. As an example, here on the left, we have chained together three perceptrons. We can write down the function computed by this perceptron, as shown on the bottom left. Working out the brackets, gives us a simple linear function of four arguments, or equivalently, a single perceptron with four inputs. This will always happen, no matter how we chain the perceptrons together. This is because perceptrons are linear functions. Composing together linear functions will only ever give you another linear function. We're not creating models that can learn nonlinear functions. If we're going to build networks of perceptron, that do anything that a single perceptron couldn't do, we need another trick. The simplest solution is to apply a nonlinear function to each perceptron called the activation function. This is a scalar function, a function from one number to another number, which we apply to the output of a perceptron after all the weighted inputs have been combined. One popular option, especially in the early days, is the logistic sigmoid, or simply the sigmoid. The sigmoid takes the range of numbers from positive to negative infinity and squishes them down to the interval between 0 and 1. Another more recent nonlinearity is the linear rectifier, or ReLU nonlinearity. This function just sets every negative input to 0 and keeps everything else the same. Not using an activation function is also called using a linear activation. Using these nonlinearities, we can arrange single neurons into neural networks. 
any arrangement of perceptrons and nonlinearities makes a neural network. But for ease of training, the arrangement shown here was the most popular for a very long time. It's called a feed-forward network or a multi-layer perceptron. We arrange a layer of hidden units in the middle, each of which acts as a perceptron with a nonlinearity connecting to all input nodes. Then we have one or more output nodes connecting to all nodes in the hidden layer. Note three crucial properties. There are no cycles. The network feeds forward from input to output. Nodes in the same layer are not connected to each other or to any other layer than the one just before it. And each layer is fully connected to the previous layer. Every node in the layer connects to every node in the layer before it. In the 80s and 90s, feedforward networks usually had just one hidden layer because we hadn't figured out how to train deeper networks. Later, we began to see networks with more hidden layers, but still following these basic rules. Note that in this picture, every orange and blue line represents one parameter of our model. With that, let's see how we can use such a feedforward network to attack some basic machine learning problems. If we want to train a regression model, a model that predicts a numeric value, we can put nonlinearities on the hidden nodes and no activation on the output node. That way, the output node can range from negative to positive infinities and the nonlinearities on the hidden layer ensure that we can learn functions that a single perceptron couldn't learn. We can think of the first layer as learning some nonlinear transformation of the inputs, the features in machine learning parlance. And we can think of the second layer as performing linear regression, but on these derived nonlinear features. The next step is to figure out a loss function. This tells you how well your network is doing with its current weights. The lower the loss, the better you are doing. Here's what that looks like for a simple regression problem. We feed the network someone's age and weight, and we ask it to predict their blood pressure. We then compare the predicted blood pressure to the true blood pressure, which we assume is given by the data, and the loss should then be a value that is high if the prediction is very wrong, and that gets lower as the prediction gets closer to the truth. A simple loss function for regression is the squared error. We just take the difference between the prediction y and the truth t, and we square it. This gives us a value that is zero for a perfect prediction, and that gets larger as the difference between y and t gets bigger. The loss can be defined for a single instance, as it is here, or for all instances in the data. Usually the loss over the whole data is just the average loss over all instances. With the loss function defined, we can start looking for weights, that is model parameters, that result in a low loss over the data. The better our model, the lower the loss. If we imagine a model with just two weights, then the set of all models, which we call the model space, forms a plane. For every point in this plane, our loss function defines a loss. We can draw this above the plane as a surface, the loss surface, sometimes also called more poetically the loss landscape. Note here that the symbol theta is a common notation referring to the set of all weights of a model, sometimes combined into a vector or sometimes just a set. Here's what our loss surface might look like for a model with just two parameters. Our job is to search the loss surface for a low point. When the loss is low, the model predictions are close to the target labels and we found a model that does well. This is a common way of summarizing this aim of machine learning. We have a large space of possible parameters, theta, with theta representing a single choice of model. And in this space, we want to find the specific theta for which the loss on our chosen data set is minimized. So, how do we find the lowest point on a surface? This is where calculus comes in. In one dimension, we can approximate a function at a particular point by finding the tangent line at that point, the line that just touches the function without crossing it. The slope of the tangent line tells us how much the line rises if we take one step to the right, in this case a negative value, because the line actually descends. This is a good indication of how much the function itself rises as well, at least at the point at which we took the tangent. This slope of the tangent is called the derivative. 
If our input space for our function has multiple dimensions, as in the case of the model space, which is the input to the loss function, then we can simply take a derivative with respect to each input separately, treating the others as constants. This is called a partial derivative. The collection of all partial derivatives taken together is called the gradient, and it's indicated by this upside-down triangle called a nabla. The partial derivatives of the loss surface, one for each model weight, tells us how much the loss falls or rises if we increase each weight. That is, if we move in a particular direction along the axis of the model space. Clearly, this is information that can help us decide how to change the weights. If we interpret the gradient as a vector, we get an arrow in the model space. This arrow points in the direction in which the function grows the quickest. Taking a step in the opposite direction means we are descending the loss surface. In our case, this means that if we can work out the gradient of the loss, then we can take a small step in the opposite direction and be sure that we are moving to a lower point on the loss surface. Or to put it differently, to be sure that we are improving our model. To summarize, the gradient is an arrow that points in the direction of steepest ascent. That is, the gradient of our loss at the dot is the direction in which the loss increases the quickest. So the opposite of that direction is the direction in which we want to move. This is why we care about the gradient. It helps us find a downward direction on the loss surface. All we have to do is follow the negative gradient and we will end up lowering our loss. This is the idea behind the gradient descent algorithm. We start with some initial weights, then for each instance in our data, we compute the gradient of the loss given our current model parameters. We take this gradient, we multiply it by some value alpha, and we subtract it from our current model parameters to give us our new model parameters. And then we simply repeat until we're happy. The reason we scale the gradient is because we would like to take small steps. Note that the gradient is only the direction of steepest descent locally. It's a linear approximation to a nonlinear function. So the bigger the step we take, the further we move from our current position, the worse an approximation this will be for the function that we are actually trying to follow. That's why we only take a small step and then recompute the gradient for our new position. We can compute the gradient of the loss with respect to a single example for our data set, a small batch of examples, or over the whole data set in one go. These options are usually called stochastic, mini-batch, and full-batch gradient descent, respectively. Note, however, that these terms are used interchangeably in the literature, but we'll try to stick to these definitions in the course. In deep learning, we almost always use mini-batch gradient descent. But there are some use cases where full batch is also used. The amount by which we scale the gradient is called the learning rate. And if we need to make multiple passes over our data set, each one of those passes is called an epoch. So that is the basic idea of neural networks. We define a perceptron, a simplified model of a neuron, which we chain together into a neural network with nonlinearities added. We then define a loss and train by gradient descent to find good weights. What we haven't discussed is how to work out the gradient of a loss function over a neural network. For simple functions, like linear classifiers, this can be done by hand. For more complex functions, like deep neural networks, this is no longer feasible and we need some help. This help comes in the form of the backpropagation algorithm. This is a complex and very important algorithm, so we will leave it aside for now and dive into it in the next lecture. Before we move on, it's important to note that the name neural network is not much more than a historical artifact. The original neural networks were very loosely inspired by the networks of neurons in our head. But even then, the artificial neural nets were so simplified that they had little to do with the real thing. Today's neural nets are nothing like brain networks and serve in no way as a realistic model of what happens in our head. In short, don't read too much into the name.